welcome and good morning. It's about, say, 10 a.m. Pacific time, but more importantly, it's time for the Kindle UI summer release keynote. Whether you're in Silicon Valley or Hyderabad, India, we're just glad you're here. We're honored that you've chosen to spend your time with us this morning, and trust me when I say that this is the best way that you could be spending it. My name is Burke Holland. It's my pleasure to be with you this morning talking about Kindo UI once again. We do three major releases of Kindo UI each year, and I've had the distinct privilege of being a part of every one of them since our very first beta launch back in 2011. Now, before we officially get started, let's do uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. We have a lot of people on with us today, and unfortunately, the internet is sometimes a disappointing place of flaky connections and overloaded circuits. It may cause you to experience some difficulties. If this happens to you and, and you have problems with your audio or a video, just take a minute to drop into the Q&A section. We've got moderators standing by to help in any way they can. Now, they're not actually doctors, but they did stay at a holiday in last night, so they, they could probably help you out. If you find yourself unable to watch the webinar, you get drug off into some other project, don't, don't worry about it. We're recording this whole webinar and you'll be able to watch it shortly after the broadcast on YouTube in full HD. Now you're gonna wanna know when that broadcast is available. The best way to keep up on all the new things happening at Kindo UI and Telerik is to follow our official channels on Twitter. We've got a lot of great things cooking in the kitchen and you'll be one of the first ones to know if you're following those accounts. So you probably want to go ahead and do that. Now, we always give away some great prizes when we have webinars. I personally have never won, even though I've been at every single webinar. They tell me it's a conflict of interest or something like that. But you, on the other hand, have several opportunities to walk away with some great swag today. Now, first off, we're going to be giving away that glorious timepiece, the Apple Watch. We're going to be giving one of these away to the person who asked the best question. You can ask questions all through the webinar, so just drop into the Q&A section and fire away. We're also giving away a killer sound system from Bauer and Wilkins. This is a Bluetooth uh, AirPlay ready sound system and it's amazing. We're gonna give this away to the person with the best feature suggestion for Kindo UI. Our PM, Stefan, is on the line and is gonna comb through your suggestions very carefully. So this is your chance to request the feature that you've always wanted to see most in Kindo UI and win a sweet prize in the process. It's great. Of course, just simply by being here today, you're eligible to win some great prizes. We're gonna be doing a drawing for a Fitbit Surge. This is the fantastic wearable from Fitbit with five days of battery life. Just a fantastic wearable device. And we're also gonna be giving away three Kindo UI professional licenses. Again, you're eligible to win these just by registering for the webinars. If you get kicked off or something happens, don't worry, you're still in the running. We'll be announcing our winners on social media accounts that I mentioned earlier, so if I didn't already suggest this, you'll wanna follow those. Now today's webinar is a bit different from anything that we've really done in the past. We've spent a lot of time beefing up our responsive web support in this last release. Now the problem is that we've been constantly adding better and better responsive capabilities to Kindo UI for the past few years. So we wanna take this webinar to cover the entire responsive web story for Kindo UI. As a brief review, responsive design is a term that refers to a page's ability to change its appearance based on the size of the screen on which it's being viewed. Whether you're starting from scratch or attempting to retrofit an existing application, it's important to know your options and to implement wisely. Responsive design just isn't about collapsible nav bars and stacking components. It's also about adapting UI components and functionality to go from the desktop to a mobile device. It's about layouts. It's about so much. And we want to cover all of that today from front to back, introducing all of the new things that we've put into Kindo UI in this release. Now we've really taken this to heart, starting with our own demos. Our new demos are designed to run on a much smaller screen. While the old demos weren't necessarily mobile friendly, the new ones have been completely redone to be responsive all the way down to the nav bar, even the mobile theme chooser. This is probably also a good time to point out that the Kindle UI mobile demos have been moved. You will now find them under a section called hybrid, and they always default to the full screen demos of Kindle UI mobile. So all that said, let's get started already, right? Okay, to do that, allow me to welcome to the virtual stage Senior Developer Advocate TJ Vantol, who's gonna kick it off 
talking about layouts and some best practices with layouts and how they integrate uh, specifically Bootstrap and Zurb Foundation with Kindo UI. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to TJ. TJ, the webinar is yours. Awesome. Thanks, Burke. One of the things we're really proud of with Kendo UI is our ability to really seamlessly integrate with other popular web libraries and frameworks. In the JavaScript world, this means libraries like jQuery, which Kendo UI builds on top of, as well as AngularJS, which as of last year, Kendo UI offers official integration with, as well as a multitude of other JavaScript frameworks like Knockout, Backbone, and so forth, that you'll find that Kendo UI works really well alongside of. But what you might not know is that the same sort of elegant integration works just as well in the CSS world. And to show that today, I'm going to demonstrate how you can use Kendo UI with the two most popular CSS frameworks out there, Zurb Foundation and Bootstrap. I'll be doing so in the context of a small little company called World Cup Fan. World Cup Fan being the premier hypothetical hub for all things World Cup. World Cup Fan got a lot of traffic from the recent Women's World Cup, but like me and like a lot of us out there, they're still really struggling with how to best present all this content and all this data that they have on the really increasingly eclectic set of screens that their audience and their, their users have. So what they've been doing is some prototyping with libraries like Foundation and Bootstrap to see the sort of things that they can build. Let's take a look at what they're doing and starting with Foundation. If you're not familiar with Foundation, it offers a bunch of features to really just help you build responsive sites. This includes everything from media query helpers to visual grids to some small JavaScript components. World Cup Fan has been using this feature to throw together a simple little prototype of what their new site might look like. You can see that Foundation gives them some nice looking tables, a nice looking nav bar here. All of these things are very responsive. So as I resize the screen down here, you can see the table still looks nice. The nav bar collapses into this little menu. But what Foundation doesn't give World Cup Fan are the sort of feature rich and really highly customizable widgets that a library like Kendo UI provides. And to give an idea of what I mean by this, let's add in a few widgets to see how we can spice up this UI. So what I'll do is I'll toss this back over on this side of the screen and bring up the code that makes up this site. What I'm going to do is find the table that controls this schedule, which is actually down over here. I'm actually going to rip this thing out and replace it with just a single calendar div and add a little bit of JavaScript to toss some Kendo UI widgets in here. Now, all I'm doing is taking that calendar div, turning it into a Kendo UI calendar widget. I'm marking a few of the dates as special. Basically, I'm just getting a list of events or World Cup matches from my API, World Cup Fans API. And I'm using a bit of code, just pulled directly from the Kendo UI demos here, to mark those special dates with a special class name here, class name of game. And I'm going to use that to do some special styling for those dates, as well as show a little tooltip on those dates as well. I'm going to save this, head back to the browser, bring this up full screen. And you can see that I now have this nice little calendar that shows me little tooltips of the different days are up and gives me a really nice way of browsing this data in sort of an interactive fashion. Now, in a more robust implementation, I'd probably do something like show a Kendo UI widget when these things are clicked or do some navigation to some other page that had been built. But for, while, for now, I want you to notice just how well this widget fits into this sort of foundation workflow. This calendar automatically took up the full width of the screen because the table that was there before did. And if I resize my window here, see how the calendar nicely adapts to these different screen sizes, even things like the tooltip handle the resize really elegantly. Let's keep going here. Bring this back over here. And the next thing I want to tackle is this little stat section down here. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to rip out the entire current implementation here. I'm going to add a few IDs or a few divs here with some IDs for a JavaScript hook. I'm going to go down to the code here. Currently, what World Cup fan is doing is they're getting some results, basically matches that have happened from the World Cup from their back end. They're using that to throw together the table that you see at the very bottom of the screen here. So I'm going to just rip that completely out and using it to build this select here. And what I'm going to do instead, and I'll go full screen here, is use a Kendo UI dropdown list. And what this allows me to do is have a little more control, actually a lot more control over the display of the items that appear in this dropdown box. Now, from the name of this variable here, you might get an idea of what I'm going to do here. The other thing I'm going to do is when the value of this dropdown changes, I'm actually going to throw the data in some nice looking Kendo UI charts instead of that table that appears on the bottom of the screen. 
So I'm going to save that, head back to my browser here. We'll go full screen and refresh that. And now I get this really nice looking drop down list. It has a list of the different countries that appeared in the World Cup. Let's see, how did Mexico do this year? Uh, not so well as well as some Kendo UI charts that you see that appear as this dropdown changes. Like the calendar above, these widgets fit nicely into this foundation workflow. And even as I resize my window here, you can see that the charts, even these more complex charts, resize nicely as the browser size changes. I want to show one more thing with this example. One of the things I haven't talked about is how foundation lets you configure basically how things are arranged on the screen. Foundation gives you these class names, for instance, this large 12. What Foundation is doing is actually dividing the screen up into 12 columns. And you get to determine on large screens and medium screens and small screens exactly how many of these columns different items on your screen take up. So for instance, right now I'm seeing the schedule takes up all 12 columns on large screens, which is why if I bring this back full size, the schedule is so big here. Now, personally, I think this is a little big on, on a large screen. This takes up a ton of real estate. So what I want to do is show these three things, these three big components here side by side in the top row. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to get rid of the row. You can see how this page currently has three rows. I'm going to dump one of those out. What I'm going to say is I want on large screens, each of these things to take up four columns or each take up one third of the current, the total screen real estate. I'll go back here and refresh. And you can see how each of these widgets now nicely appear side by side. I could also go in and configure what happens on medium sized screens, which is what you're seeing here, or small size screens as well. But the key here is that since these Kendo UI widgets adapt so nicely to these various screen sizes, it's really easy, it's trivial to tinker with these sorts of variables and class names that libraries like Foundation provide to configure your display and to build a really rich interface. This sort of tinkering is also possible with the Bootstrap framework. So what I've done is I've actually thrown together the same sort of example, just using Bootstrap instead of Foundation. You can see the display is slightly different. This is actually the Bootstrap style nav bar, which is similar to Foundation, but just slightly different. It collapses into this little hamburger menu here that collapses and expands. The other difference you might notice is in how the Kendo UI widgets work. With the Foundation theme, I was actually using Kendo UI's relatively new material design theme. So it gives this drop-down list this really cool look. But with Bootstrap specifically, Kendo UI actually offers an official Bootstrap theme that integrates directly with the Bootstrap library. That's why, for instance, you can see that the calendar fits in very nicely with this nav bar. And all I'm doing to control that, if I go to the code here, is just using kendo.bootstrap.css. It's a little difficult to see the integration with the current UI. So what I'm going to do is actually get rid of this stat section and replace it with a new one, just a little form here. I'll just save this and show what it looks like. This form is actually kind of a fun aggregation of the best of what Kendo UI and Bootstrap have to offer. If you look here, a lot of these styles are coming directly from Bootstrap. This is a Bootstrap well style. Uh, these form controls are using the Bootstrap styles as well. If you go over to the Bootstrap docs, you'll see it looks a lot like these forms that appear here. The buttons look a lot like Bootstrap buttons as well. But you can see that uh, there's a few Kendo UI widgets in here as well. This is the drop down with the flags that we saw before, has the nice Bootstrap look to it. Even this complex editor looks really nice within this Bootstrap well. As you might expect, this is, form is also responsive. So as I shrink things down here, you can see that once I reach medium sized screens, the switch, this form switches from a two column layout to a one column one, and it looks good even down to tiny little screens here. And like before, Bootstrap offers a similar set of classes that Foundation does to sort of arrange the screen in sorts of rows and columns. It actually uses the exact same class name to build rows on the screens. So I can do the same sort of thing as before and get rid of my row here. And I'll say that the schedule, which is currently taking up all 12 columns on the screen, I'm going to say that it actually just takes up four or one third. And I'll make this well here take up eight or two thirds just to give you an idea of what this looks like. And I'll resize the screen up to full screen. And you can see now that the calendar nicely takes up one third of the screen and the form takes up the other two thirds. Overall, what's cool about this is that you can use Kendo UI in the context of some of these popular web libraries that you may already know and love. And that doing so really gives you a best of both worlds scenario. You can use the responsive functionality and CSS components that libraries like Bootstrap and Foundation have to offer and use the Kendo UI widgets to add in some of this really robust JavaScript functionality, and the two of them fit right in together. But all of this is really just the first piece of the Kendo UI responsive story. 
For more, I'm going to turn things over to my friend and our resident Kenzo UI expert, Cody Lindley, who's going to take things from here. Cody? Thanks, TJ. Like TJ said, my name's Cody. I'm a senior developer advocate working specifically on Kendo UI. I'm going to be covering two things today. The first thing I'm going to cover is basically how to use the Kendo UI splitter in a responsive manner. And then next, we'll look at how widgets auto resize, and we'll also look at the widgets that don't auto resize and that require us to call the resize method on them in order for them to resize themselves to parent elements. Now, all of these topics will be covered as we build out a miniature application using the Women's World Cup JSON endpoints. As you can see here, we have a couple different endpoints that we could be using. Uh, we're specifically going to be using the endpoints that list out all the teams and all the results for each individual team. We'll use both these sets of data to create a user interface. And as you can see here, we, we have basically all of the results for each team. And you can filter these results based on each individual team. Now that's kind of a peek at what we're going to build. This code's actually immediately available. It's at a JS bin, so you can go grab it if you want and follow along with me. If that URL is a little bit small for you, I actually paste it into a text file. There we go, that's a little bit better. Go ahead and follow along with me if you want by visiting this URL. You have all the code available to you immediately. Okay, let's jump in and start looking at some code. Gonna minimize this browser window so we can work with it a little better. Jump over to the HTML page we're gonna be working with. And as you can see in Sublime here, it's a pretty standard HTML document. We, of course, are to have Kendo UI and jQuery um, being included. Uh, I'm also using one style sheet, and I'm also using one JavaScript file. So the first thing that we're gonna do is actually put the all important World Cup fan logo into the page. Now, you'll notice that this image that I'm putting into the page is styled with a width of 100%. So if we save that, the page is going to reload and we see our World Cup fan logo. Now, because the image is actually at 100%, you're going to see that image at different sizes depending upon which device you're on. Okay, I think we're good there. Now, one thing I want to call to your attention is the fact that all of the code for this application is actually wrapped in a load, an image load event. And really what this means is before I lay out the rest of this page, I want to make sure the size of this image is determined. So this image will be downloaded, then it will be sized, and then we're going to run the rest of the application code. Just wanted to call that out in case anybody wondered why all of this code was wrapped in a load event. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do is actually create a Kendo UI splitter. So I'm gonna uncomment this code. There's a couple elements in here. I'm going to comment because we're just not quite ready to get to that code yet. We'll hit save and nothing occurred. Nothing occurred because we haven't actually instantiated the widget yet. So to instantiate the widget, I'm gonna uncomment this code. And all I'm doing up here is I'm saving a reference to the splitter uh, DOM element in the HTML page. I'm saving a reference uh, wrapped with the jQuery object of the window itself. And I'm creating a, a variable called width. Then I simply Use Kendo Splitter here to create a splitter with two panes. So let's go ahead and save that. And as you can see, we've got a Kendo Splitter here with two panes. So next, I actually want to make this splitter responsive. So I'm going to uncomment this code, and we're going to look at this uh, step by step here. So essentially, I'm tying a function, a throttled function. Uh, to the resize event of the window. And every time the window is resized, we're going to calculate the width of the window, and then we're going to ask if it's less than or equal to 400, 
or if it's greater than 400 and we're going to set the size of the splitter. And if we're on a mobile device, let's say we're actually going to collapse one of the panels. Uh, let me go down here and uncomment uh, this trigger to have it actually resize on page load. Okay, so now if I save it, what should happen is, is the browser reloads and we get a, a splitter that fills the page and is sized to 200 pixels. That's exactly what we're after. But of course, if we go over and look at it on a mobile device, uh, the pane, a mobile device being less than 400 pixels in width, uh, the pane's actually closed. So that's exactly what we want. One thing I forgot to call out here is the fact that the resize event on the splitter widget is called every time the browser window resizes. And the reason that that is is that the splitter widget is in an auto resizing widget. In other words, uh, when the parent element, or in this case the body element in this HTML page, changes its size due to a browser resize, we have to tell the splitter that a resize occurs and then the splitter will adjust itself after that resize event is called. Oh, I, you know what? I just noticed that I don't need that grid resize yet because we don't have a grid and I already have a window reference that's wrapped with jQuery. So I think I'm going to save that and I think we're good. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is actually add some buttons to one of the panes. And in order to do that, I am going to uncomment this Teams div. Now, it's this Teams div. Actually, let me uh, comment this button. We don't need it yet. This Team div is actually where all a list of all the teams is going to live. And in, uh, let me save that and jump back over to the JavaScript. So in order to get a list of the teams, um, we're going to uncomment the teams data. And this uses a Kendo uh, data source to grab the teams JSON data and it sorts it alphabetically. And so now we have our data. And now I'm going to go down here and uncomment this view model uh, that we use in an MVVM pattern. So here I set up a view model where I store my teams data. Um, and of course, we have a, a function in here that uh, when the buttons uh, in our list are clicked, the select team function fires. And this will affect our grid that we haven't created yet. But in order to bind these buttons with uh, the data, we use kendo bind and we grab the teams div and we bind this view model. So let me jump back over to the HTML and just explain this a little bit more. Uh, when the JavaScript runs, essentially, we're binding this uh, view model here to this div, uh, and I'm binding the source, the team's data source from our view model. I'm using this template down here. Now, here is where the button's actually created. This, this, a this anchor represents the buttons, and it automatically occurs for us that a button's created, a button widget using this data role button. So, as you can see here in the browser, we have our buttons. Now, actually, these are just the filters, so we still want an all button to undo the filters once we start using them, so I'll uncomment that. And this is our all buttons. I'm gonna jump back to the JavaScript, and we need to find our all button. Here we go. So we'll uncomment that. This creates a button uh, that allows us to undo uh, the filters that we apply. So now I think it's probably time to create the grid. So what I need um, is the data for the grid. So we'll uncomment the team's result data. I'm kind of doing the same thing here, creating data source from the JSON uh, team's results, JSON API. Uh, we're gonna sort it alphabetically. And then I also need to create that grid and pass that data to the grid. So if we hit save now, what we should see occur, oh, I think I forgot to uncomment the, here we go. We gotta have the div for the grid. So now if I press save, there we go, we see the results for each team. And if I click on a particular team, we're just gonna see the results for that particular team. And if I click on all, then we'll see all the results again. 
One of the things I want to mention here is that this filter is actually filtering the data source. And when that data source is filtered, it actually updates the grid. It sort of happens for you um, automatically, uh, which is a really nice feature of the dat using data sources with widgets. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do, uh, let me jump back here and make sure it is uncommented. Um, we need a filter button so that when we're in a mobile mode, uh, we actually hide one of those panes. So I'm gonna uncomment that button. I'm gonna hit save. And now we should see a filter button up there, but we don't because I need to uncomment the code that instantiates that. So there we go. Here I'm creating a filter button. You see it up here in the corner now. And when I click it, it hides the pane, just toggles that pane. And of course, on a mobile device, this is really nice because uh, when we pull it up on a mobile device, our grid auto resizes, um, our pane is hidden. We can open up that uh, pane with our filters. And the we, one a feature that I have going on here, if uh, you're on a mobile device, is that it actually closes the pane when you make a selection. So if we go back here to all, we can see all of our results and it works perfectly on a mobile device and it works on a desktop. Um, this is all taking advantage of some of the Kendo UI widgets. Uh, and I'm also showing code that, you know, deals with the fact that some of the widgets will auto resize like the buttons and some of the widgets won't auto resize. Uh, for instance, the splitter or the grid here. Um, if you're curious which uh, widgets auto resize, resize and which don't, I'm showing a list here. You can find this document in the Kendo UI documentation. And I think that's pretty much it for me. Jen, take it away. Hello everyone, my name is Jen Looper. I'm a developer advocate at Telerik, and I'm really excited to talk about the adaptive nature of some of our Kendo UI widgets. So far, we've talked about all the awesome tools that you can use to make your sites respond well to a screen resize. Kendo UI widgets actually are a really great helper for this task, but what about those widgets that just don't work that well at a smaller size? You really shouldn't have to sacrifice features for pixels. In order to have it all, you have to take your app beyond responsive design. You need adaptive design. With adaptive design, you're going to make sure that the widget provides a great experience even on quite small screens. Kendo UI is smart enough to know what works on small screens and flexible enough to allow you a lot of leeway in how you manage the resize. I created a SPA, a single page app, using Kendo UI's toolset for building websites. By using the Kendo router and its SPA framework, I can easily create a single page app that doesn't have to refresh the page in order to load new content. The use case here is to create a website that will adapt to mobile screens. Let's talk about Kendo's adaptive widgets that make this job a little bit easier. Okay, let's get started building up this website. First up, we have a responsive panel that's tailor-made to enhance a mobile experience. This is the panel that's a left nav or right nav on larger screens, but it collapses and shows a hamburger icon on the smaller screens. First, we initialize the Kendo responsive panel widget in our JavaScript file, transforming our sidebar div into a panel. And note that there's a breakpoint there and width. We add some extra media queries in our custom CSS to ensure that the sidebar looks great when the browser width hits 1,000 pixels. And then we go ahead and build up the sidebar just as a set of links to create a left nav block. And we add a button that's going to be our hidden hamburger icon. And you can change the orientation of the button in the panel to account for right to left layouts as well. Just change the Kendo responsive panel's orientation from left to right, change your icon text buttons float from left to right, and voila, your website is flipped and your navigation now flows from right to left. Let's add another adaptive widget to help this site's navigation. I think we need a toolbar. It's easy enough to add a toolbar by specifying a div with the ID toolbar, and then by initializing that toolbar in the JavaScript file with all the buttons that you need listed out. OK, so far, so good. Let's check it out on a mobile screen. Uh-oh, that's not great. Let's fix it. I'd actually set the resizable flag to false, so I was being a little sneaky, so that the adaptive resizing couldn't happen. But if we remove that flag, we see the very nice adaptive nature of this widget. It looks great now. All the buttons we can't show horizontally collapse into a hamburger icon button, and it looks really nice. 
And this example actually shows how some widgets are adaptive out of the box, but you can control that aspect of them really easily. I want to show you the very awesome tab strip widget now. I actually got really excited when I saw this just work right out of the box with a nice smooth animation. Um, I wanted to show some pictures of the various national soccer teams on the site's homepage. So I started working on the homepage's markup. Aren't these ladies awesome? Okay, to create a tabbed interface, it's so easy. All you do is to create a div with data role tab strip, and then you add an unordered list to build the tabs themselves. And Kendo UI then builds the interface for you, stacking the divs within your tab strip div on top of each other to form that interface. Oh, and by the way, I used Flexbox behind the scenes uh, to get the grid of pictures and the images themselves to respond to that screen resize. And the nice adaptive element I want to show off to you guys is the new scrollable tabs, which work right out of the box, to allow you to scroll through your tabs on a small screen and get at your content easily. It looks really nice. Let's turn our attention to what's probably Kendo's most famous widget, the awesome grid, to showcase the soccer matches that were recently played. We know the grid, we love the way it filters and sorts data, but it also actually has a lot of adaptive firepower on mobile screens. To initiate the uh, adaptive grid, I add declarative markup to my site's matches page, and I specify the grid's data role. I give it a data role grid. I add the data columns that I want to show, and I set the grid to be filterable and sortable. I then, I then bind a data source to it. The data I'm using is coming from an external API, which is essentially a bunch of JSON formatted data about these teams and the matches. I'm reading in the data and setting its page size to 10, just to speed up the grid's rendering. Okay, let's take another look at the grid markup. Notice that we're setting a min screen width attribute of increasing values. And what we're doing is telling the grid to always show the field country, but to only show the FIFA code if the screen has a minimum width of 550 and so on. Essentially, we want to see more columns of this grid as the screen size increases, rather than trying to smoosh all the columns into a small space. Okay, let's take a look in a simulator. I'm going to use a different Chrome extension so that we can have some more options. So how is this thing going to look on a, on a Blackberry? Hmm, how about an iPhone 4? It's not too bad. So you have a lot of control over what columns the grid will show, depending on the width of your screen. One widget that's similar to the grid, but is actually really useful on mobile, is the tree list, because it can compact data so easily. So for this demo, I had to mock up some team data, again looking at the relationship of players to teams, because I wanted to show team rosters in a tree list format. So to build a tree list widget, I created another div using declarative markup, like we've done before, on my roster page with the data role as tree list, and I made it selectable. I specified the columns and I bound some data to it. So for the demo, I mocked up some roster data as a tree list data source with some of the team members and their affiliation. And I included a schema with the model to specify to the tree list the relationship of the team members to their parent team so that the tree list is built properly. Looking at this tree list on a mobile simulator, we find a very neat rep representation of the teams with an expandable list of the team roster. Notice the way the columns are automatically truncating the long text in the columns, adding an ellipsis where appropriate. When the data is expanded, the same thing happens. The data is automatically resized. Because we've set the width of the columns to be 150 pixels, this value is picked up on the small screen as a breakpoint for the column, but it doesn't constrict the column size on a larger screen. It's really pretty neat. Our website needs a way for fans to schedule events, so let's take a look at the scheduler, which is a really powerful calendar and agenda widget with all kinds of bells and whistles, including choices of buttons, pop-up windows, and all kinds of date manipulation behind the scenes. So to create a scheduler, you can just add a div with some declarative markup, giving it the data role of scheduler, specifying what views you want to show, and binding it to data for your date. In our JavaScript file, we can bind to external data to manage our tasks, although for this demo I haven't done that, as I just want to show you how the scheduler adapts to a screen resize. So notice that as you resize to a small screen, the month and agenda buttons compress to a dropdown, and the window for scheduling events resizes itself automatically, and all this adaptive goodness is out of the box. Kendo UI has beautiful animated data visualizations, and I'm short on time, but I want to just show a few charts and mention their adaptive possibilities. 
If we want to show results in a pie chart, it looks phenomenal on a mobile device. And a line chart looks just as good. To ensure that your data fits nicely on a mobile screen, however, you're going to need to add a little JavaScript to ensure that the labels are slanted slightly down. This sort of adaptive feature isn't handled out of the box, but you have a lot of control over what you can do to a chart to make it look even better on a small screen. Okay, last but not least, we have a nice little editor widget that has a surprise up its sleeve. Since our fans want to submit fan fiction, I have no idea what that means, we need to give them an editor for their writing. The Kendo editor has a great feature that allows you to add as many buttons as you like in your markup, and when the screen size is reduced, they collapse into a hamburger icon. To create an adaptive experience for users of this widget on the smaller screens, all you need to do is declare all the buttons you want to display, and then add to your declarative markup the configuration Data Resizable with the toolbar set to Resize. And like magic, the buttons of the editor collapse into a hamburger icon as you resize the screen. I hope you've enjoyed this whirlwind tour of the adaptive widgets in Kendo UI. Next, you'll hear from John Bristow about some of the goodies we're delivering on the mobile side. John, over to you. Thanks, Jen. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. As Jen mentioned, I'm going to spend a few minutes highlighting features and improvements we've added to the mobile story of Kendo UI. I'm also going to show you the best of the rest of what we've added to this latest release. Let's start by talking about Kendo UI for mobile. If you've used Kendo UI to build mobile apps, then you know that one of the things it does really well is something called adaptive rendering. This is where widgets adapt to the look and feel of the operating system for the device on which they are running. Sometimes, though, you don't want that. You want an app that looks the same everywhere. For this case, you can use our flat mobile theme, which we introduced back in July 2013. This theme is designed to provide the same look and feel everywhere, no matter the device or operating system. It also improves UI performance by about 30% because there's no need to render drop shadows or other ornamentations. With this release of Kendo UI, we're introducing an entirely new theme, and it's one that I really think you're going to love. We call this theme Nova, and it brings a fresh new look to the applications you'll build. Nova was inspired by the latest trends in mobile app design. It sports a clean look that's complemented by a set of new icons and rich topography. From buttons to drawers, forms to nav bars, we've carefully considered how to improve the interactions of each widget with this new theme. Now, the good news is that Nova is easy to use. Simply specify the theme you wish to use, and you're good to go. Let's jump over to a demo to see how this works. Here I have a simple app using Kendo UI. As you can see, it utilizes familiar widgets and their adaptive rendering that's part of Kendo UI for mobile. Using an alternate theme turns out to be pretty simple. I can simply specify the skin I wish using the configuration you see here. So I'll specify this to be flat, and you can see the result of that change occur here. Now, I want to update this application to Nova. To do so, I'll simply update my skin and refresh the view to see the changes. It's also worth noting that this new theme will be integrated into hybrid mobile projects you build with the Telerik platform, so stay tuned for that. Speaking of themes, I'd like to take a moment to talk a little bit about the Theme Builder tool for Kendo UI. The Theme Builder was one of the first tools we introduced back when Kendo UI first shipped. It's a powerful tool that enables you to quickly customize the look and feel of your Kendo UI applications, and it's been used by many of our customers. With this release of Kendo UI, we've decided to give the Theme Builder a bit of a makeover. We've redesigned the interface, as well as provided the new themes that have been integrated into Kendo UI. Once you've finished your customizations, you can download the theme and apply it to your application. Next up is an important update for our customers working on government and federal projects, Section 508 Compliance. As you may know, we've put a lot of work into ensuring that Kendo UI provides great support for accessibility out of the box. Over the last few releases, we've introduced a number of improvements, including ARIA support, keyboard shortcuts, support for right-to-left languages, and a high contrast theme, just to name a few. I'm happy to announce that with this latest release, all widgets are fully compliant with Section 508 accessibility requirements. Being in compliance with Section 508 is essential for tooling used by government and federal organizations. So great news on that front. Next up are a number of features we've added to the grid and tree list widgets. The grid widget now provides a no records property that enables you to set a template if no data is available on the current index. It also provides a new show all option for its pager, which allows users to display all items that are bound to it. This option is provided through the pager that's built in with the grid. The tree list widget now supports auto fitting the widths of columns based on cell content. 
And finally, both the grid and tree list now have the ability to cycle through their filter menu using the tab key. Let's take a look at these features in action. On this page here, you can see the results of the Women's World Cup that was recently played. Uh, I have this data bound to a Kendi UI grid that's on the page with configuration projects, uh, properties set for paging, filtering, sorting, etc. Now, oftentimes, customers want a scenario to satisfy a scenario where if there's no result set that's returned, they may want to display a message to the user. So how do we control that? Well, there, it turns out there's a new property on the grid itself that says no records. By setting that value to true, you can now display a message to the user indicating that um, there is no data to be found. Now, in order to show this to you, I'm going to go ahead and change the endpoint here. Uh, currently, it's pointing to the results of the World Cup. I'm going to change that value to today's matches, uh, which obviously is going to return an empty array. When I go ahead and now refresh this, this will display a message saying no records are available, which is great. Now, I may want to control this a little bit more. I can do that by um, adding another property here, which allows me to specify a specific message. So that, that text that you saw in the, um, in the center there, I can control how that actually looks. And so by specifying messages and, and setting a no records value, I can uh, override that. So if we go ahead and refresh, you can see it says there is no data, sad panda. A third option that's available to me is being able to specify a template for the no records property itself. And by doing so, um, it will allow me to control the rendered output found in the middle here. So let's go ahead and override this value and set its value from true to an actual template. So here we're utilizing the HTML templates infrastructure found in Kendi UI, and we're gonna display a nice picture of vanilla ice. So if we now hit refresh, you can see there is that result set indeed. So this turns out to be really, really great for scenarios where you have no data coming back from an endpoint. Obviously, if we back out these changes, uh, we've added some additional capabilities to the grid itself. Um, specifically, if uh, a user wishes to display all of the data inside the pager here, we now have this option down here at the bottom that says all. Be aware of the fact that when you specify that as a user, you are requesting all of the data from the result set itself. So as a developer, you may wanna be careful about providing that option to your users in the cases where you have a large data set potentially coming back. Finally, I'd like to talk briefly about two improvements for customers leveraging Kendi UI with ASP.NET MVC and Visual Studio. In my view, there's never been a more exciting time to be a .NET developer. That's why I'm happy to let you know that Telerik UI for ASP.NET MVC supports ASP.NET vNext and the up-to-date versions of .NET 5, MVC 6, and Visual Studio 2015. Furthermore, we remain dedicated to our commitment to provide official support for these products shortly after RTM. I'm also happy to announce that Telerik UI for ASP.NET MVC Beta is available as a public NuGet package on NuGet.org. The feed is especially useful for .NET 5 and MVC 6 projects where NuGet package management plays a central role for referencing third-party products. A private NuGet feed for our commercial customers is also in our pipeline for the next service pack of this release. This feed will be secured using your Telerik account credentials. That about wraps it up for me. I hope you're as excited as I am about the new features we've added to this latest release. I'm especially keen to leverage Nova for my mobile apps, and I'll be on the lookout for your apps in the mobile app stores with the new theme applied. Burke, back over to you. Thank you, John. Man, that new mobile theme looks amazing. I cannot wait to build some new applications using that theme. Now today we've taken you on a trip through the responsive web capabilities of Kendo UI and we've talked about all of the new and exciting features in this release and all of the really nice features that we've been adding along the way. So hopefully you've been getting your questions and feature suggestions in and if you haven't done so yet, it's not too late to do it right now. One of the questions that we get asked quite frequently by our customers, partners, and companies that are using Kendo UI is how can they find developers who really know Kendo UI? Up until now, this has been a hard question to answer. And that's why we recently launched the Certified Kendo UI Developer Exam. This is a 50 question exam that is designed to determine whether or not you actually know Kendo UI. This exam is tough, it's hard, and you can be sure that anyone who has passed it definitely knows Kendo UI. So keep your eyes peeled for the certified Kendo UI developer badge being displayed by those folks who have proudly passed the exam and earned the right to be called certified. 
Now, if you're interested in taking the exam yourself, you can sign up at any time over on our site at telerik.com slash kindo dash UI slash developer dash certification. We've already seen several folks pass the exam and we're excited to be able to put the official Kindo UI stamp of approval next to these names. Another thing we want to let you know about is the new Telerik podcast, Eat, Sleep, Code. This is the official Telerik podcast. We're going to be discussing all things development, whether it's web, whether it's native, whether it's desktop, whether it's mobile. All of these things we're going to be covered in our podcast. Additionally, if you'd like to be on the podcast to talk about what you're doing, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact Ed Charbonneau. Just visit our community page on developer.telerik.com. Now is probably also a good time for me to give you some updates on the Telerik platform. This is Telerik's integrated set of tools and services for enabling you to build native mobile applications using your existing web skills. Whether you're building a phone gap or hybrid application using that gorgeous new Kindle UI mobile theme like I'll be doing, or one of the many developers who are building with native script, Telerik's brand new runtime for building truly native mobile applications with simple JavaScript. The platform provides data storage. It provides push notifications, user authentication, application management, feedback, analytics, everything that you need, a complete application stack for mobile applications. We've also just recently released a brand new visual designer for building mobile applications called Screen Builder. This is a powerful new designer tool that lets you point and click your way to beautiful mobile applications and will export your projects either as Kindle UI mobile or in native script. You can do either or, allowing you to choose which project type works best for you. You can get a free 30-day trial to all of these tools by visiting platform.telerik.com today. Now, speaking of native script, we have a very unique opportunity for you right now. If you're a user group leader or coordinator, or maybe you're just a developer that likes to go to user groups like me, uh, we have a summer of native script promotion going on right now where if you hold a meetup on native script, just send us your URL for your meetup. We'll send you some awesome native script stickers and this sweet American apparel native script t-shirt. This thing is awesome. All you got to do to do this is visit nativescript.org, sign up for the summer of NativeScript, send us your URL, and we'll put a box in the mail. We're even going to provide you with uh, the presentation that you need to uh, give to your group, all the materials. And if you don't want to give the presentation yourself, you can show a video of the lovely TJ Van Toll and Clark Sell doing the session for you. So that's summer of NativeScript. We'd love for you to have a meetup on NativeScript, and we'd love for you to tell us about it. So really, there's only one thing left for you to do today, and that's to grab a copy of Kindo UI if you don't already have one. You can get the free and open source version of Kindo UI Core from GitHub with all of the core framework features and 22 widgets. It's a complete UI framework, completely free to use however you wish. You can get Kindo UI Professional for $6.99 from the site. And don't forget about the ASP.NET MVC wrappers for Kindo UI. These include request and response serialization, some language integrated query extensions to make your link queries very simple, um, and complete integration with MVC. So if you're an MVC developer, you'll definitely want to pick that up. You can grab that for $9.99. With that, we're going to transition to a bit of live Q&A here. Thank you so much for joining us for another massive Kindle UI release. You'll hear a bit of a cutoff here as we transition off the single webinar line into a shared connection. We'll catch you on the other side.